minutes. 35 minutes, yep, okay. That's why I was like, okay, gotta get moving here. I'm getting into a tech, lot of technical topics really quick, so. My name is Alexander Dyke. Uh, I'm an open source technologist with Intel Corporation. Um, I'm here to cover uh, some work I actually did when I was working for uh, Mirantis, which is actually an open stack uh, provider. Uh, basically, uh, what I'm gonna be covering is encapsulation offloads, specifically LCO, GSO partial, TSO mango ID, and why less is actually more. So, overall agenda, um, I'm gonna have to start out with some basics because I'm gonna be getting pretty technical on this. Uh, specifically, um, just gonna give a brief overview of checksums and UDP encapsulation. Uh, some of the work that's already been done by others to address this, specifically remote checksum offload by Tom Herbert and local checksum offload, which is uh, some work that was done by Edward Cree. Um, and then uh, get into the work I did on GSO partial or partial GSO, or partial generic segmentation offload, uh, TCP segmentation offload with ID mingling, which I'll be referring to as TSO mingle ID, um, why less functionality actually gives us the chance to do more, and uh, some conclusions and future work. So, starting off with uh, just the basics of checksums. For those that aren't familiar with checksums, basically it's the basic data verification approach taken by TCP, UDP, and IDP, uh, IPv4. Um, the logic, what you're basically doing is you're gonna go through and perform a one's complement checks, a one, one's complement sum of all of the data. The final result should be an all ones value, which is considered negative zero. Um, technically zero is equivalent, but for our purposes, uh, the zero we are concerned with is gonna be negative zero, specifically, because in the case of UDP, zero represents no checksum offload at all. And so um, I'll refer to negative zero, meaning the all Fs value uh, going forward. Um, one of the advantages to doing it as a ones complement sum is you have carries are carried into both halves of the value. So the upper uh, eight bits will carry into the lower eight bits as a carry, and the up lower eight bits carries into the upper, so it doesn't actually matter for byte ordering. So if you're on a little Indian system, a big Indian system, just going through and performing the ones complement sum will give you the same value regardless of byte ordering, as long as you're still getting this, it's just a 16-bit uh, sum value that you're looking at. Uh, let's see. And then on most architectures, what you end up with is it's implemented as some form of add with carry. Uh, basically, you're just going through and adding whatever carry you had into your next value as you add it together. So, um, Good example being you add one to the all apps or all ones value, it should give you the value one as a result because you're essentially adding zero to a number. So one plus zero, which in this case is all ones, the first iteration through would give you zero, but there's a one in the carry field. So then you add that back in and it gives you back one. And so that's how the identity properties kind of work for the ones complement checksum. Or ones complement sum. And so, in terms of generating the sums themselves, uh, there's a few basic rules for setting this all up. Uh, in the case of IPv4, what you end up doing is you just populate the checksum value with zero. You wanna go through, sum the whole value, um, and then you perform the ones, you get the ones complement of that value, and you store that as the checksum. And then, by doing that, what you can then do is go through and validate. You add the entire uh, ones complement sum of the IP header, what you should get is the uh, negative zero or the all ones value, and then you know that that checksum is valid. For TCP and UDP, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, in the case of TCP and UDP, we have the idea of a pseudo header, which is included as part of the checksum. It's not a, any actual data that's part of the transport, but it's something that gets added in. Um, and those extra fields usually consist of the source IPv4 or IPv6 addresses, same thing for the destination, a protocol number which gets padded out to 16 bits um, in the byte order that you're processing in. So if you're processing, uh, well normally it'll be a uh, big Indian if you're processing everything in the native network byte order. So you have to convert it from an 8-bit value to a 16-bit big Indian value. And then uh, 
the length. So you add those all together, you store that one's complement sum in the L4 checksum value for the transport. So when we ask for something like NetFF hardware CSUM as a feature, we expect to have that value populated so that then from that point on, the hardware can just start at that point, compute the whole checksum, and store it in the resultant offset value, which happens to be where we stored the pseudo checksum. So that's the basics of checksum. Now we start getting into the basics of UDP encapsulation, which in the grand scheme of things is all fairly simple until, well, it, it gets complicated when we start think, taking offloads into account. So basic idea, here I'm showing you, we have a standard TCP frame we put together. So we want to send it across the tunnel. Let's see, is this thing got a laser pointer? Yeah. So what we end up doing is we stuff, in this case I'm using VXLAN as an example, but this could be any kind of uh, UDP metadata, or any kind of tunnel metadata. So we could have Foo, uh, Geneve. Uh, there ends up being a lot of different types you can basically stick on here. In theory, you could even just have nothing and just have a tunnel that's basically just based on pure port number if you wanted to. But essentially, you have this extra UDP section that you're adding so you can move this entire section across to the other end and then strip that header off and move this across the network as though it's all one, two, uh, one logical L2 segment. So, like I was saying, it, that piece of it makes it easy, but then all of a sudden we have all these complications. Um, one of the big ones being existing hardware sees a UDP packet, it thinks, okay, it's a UDP packet, I'm going to process a UDP packet. Well, it, it adds some certain complications. In addition, we're dealing with switches that want to be able to add these headers. Switches traditionally don't add and remove checksums to packets. So in the uh, specification for VXLAN, for instance, they suggested you should not use the outer checksum and set it to zero. The problem is, okay, then, you know, as a NIC, you receive a frame, oh, it's UDP, no checksum, okay, just pass up the stack, which means now we've lost RSS, uh, uh, RX checksum, GRO, et cetera, passing it up the stack that way. And so we have to start doing some parsing in software to try to counteract some of that. But then, like I said, we just lost checksum, so that makes GRO harder. Um, in addition, if the hardware is trying to do something like TSO, we can't segment it if we don't know how to deal with those extra headers that were added onto the frame. So that's another complication in all this. So we need to find a way to work around that. And in, in addition, we start having other problems uh, in that presentation earlier, just adding a uh, IPv6 extension header, you know, broke IXGBE. You know, it couldn't do TX checksums at that point. Well, same kind of thing goes on for the UDP checksums. Well, you added all these tunnel headers, how is it supposed to know where the tunnel's headers are? Are we gonna add code to all the drivers going and parsing looking for that? Um, we definitely don't wanna have to do that. Uh, but some, we have to find a way to address that so actually, what I ended up doing is, in the case of the Intel drivers, uh, I just rewrote all the driver code to simplify it, made it all essentially uh, NetFF hardware checksum compliant. Um, the reason being, there's, there's essentially two different approaches to checksums. There's the IPCSUM feature, which is floating around out there, uh, the IPv and the IPv6 one as well. Most of those usually end up doing some sort of parsing inside the packet, which means they have to be able to recognize the protocols in order to be able to do the checksum offload. The advantage of NetFF hardware checksum is the stack just says your checksum starts here, you write your resultant value there, go. And so if we can support that approach, then the tunnels become easy for us to do the uh, inner TX checksums on. But there's some other complications still I need to get to um, in a second here on that. The other piece being, yeah, like I said, we can't do TSO um, and yeah, Let's see. So the other piece in all of this is we end up with more regions to checksum. So if we have an outer UDP header and we want to do a checksum on it, then we're actually asking to do two different checksums at the same time. So we need one for the TCP header and one for the UDP header. Most hardware at this point is designed to just do one, which, you know, for when we only had to deal with this one, that was great, but now that we've got the potential for two, that adds additional complications. So we need to start finding ways to deal with that. And that's uh, where we start out with us adding some new offloads. 
So Tom had uh, worked on providing remote checksum offload. So what we ended up doing, since we know we have to do with checksum and this UDP checksum was overlapping with the region that was covered by the TCP checksum, instead of providing two methods of validating the data, just focus it all down to one. And so all you need to do is include a little bit of metadata with the VXLAN header in this case, or whatever your tunnel header is, so that it knows, okay, this checksum's being deferred because we know this is gonna be encapsulated. And so we'll have the remote checksum off of data here. We'll put the packet out on the wire with just this outer checksum. On the receiver, when it decapsulates it and sends the packet somewhere else, at that point you can convert this outer checksum into an inner checksum and then let it move across the network still. This works, but it also adds some complications. Specifically, since we're now carrying some more metadata here, it means the TX uh, segmentation offloads have to be aware of it. And so if you end up with some offload here where we're actually, like in the case of RCO, fortunately for VXLAN, it doesn't change the actual header format, but for protocols that would it require extra headers, it might make things more complicated. So, we ended up looking into another solution on all this, that being local checksum offload. Uh, this is something Edward Cree actually thought up. Uh, basically what it comes down to is, like I mentioned before, when we validate a checksum, what we end up with is we should get the all, uh, the negative zero answer if we do the checksum from the end of the data to here, and we fold in the pseudo header checksum. So that means at this point, we know that the uh, resultant checksum for all of this should be the inverse of the pseudo header checksum. So knowing that, instead of having to do two checksums over all of the data, this UDP header checksum can actually be shortened quite a bit. And if there's like, you know, for instance, if we're doing IPv4 here, this also cancels itself out. So then you uh, really only need to do an IP, uh, UDP checksum over this region and then adjust for this pseudo header, and that's pretty much it. For IPv6, it gets a little bit more complicated just because we don't have the IPv4 canceling out, but we can essentially still only have to do a checksum over this region, and the, the hardware itself can take care of doing the offload for this region. So the advantage is, in the case of uh, larger frames, this region can be handled by hardware, and we're only having to do this region in software. And that gives us the advantage of this most likely, in the case of IPv6, we're looking at 70 bytes. In the case of IPv4, it's only about 50 that we have to perform the checksum on. But doing a checksum on that few bytes is considerably faster than having to do it for an entire 1500 MTU datagram. So it allows us to basically avoid having to, to focus the hardware checksum on the payload data, which ends up being a significant savings. Since before what was happening is we do this checksum in software and then offload this one to hardware. And so there ended up being no gain at all because we were having to do basically both a hardware checksum offload and a software uh, checksum. So knowing all that, we went through and we got LCO implemented. And then the question is, is there a way we can actually somehow apply this to segmentation offload? So that's what I started looking into. Um, first case being, I wanted to be able to support putting a checksum out here specifically because most hardware, um, well actually, I'll take a step back. So when RCO was implemented, one of the things Tom uh, introduced was the concept of converting the outer uh, checksum into the inner checksum. So you could basically carry it forward and you convert uh, what's called checksum complete, which is kind of the preferred way if drivers did this, we wouldn't have to do all these extra hoops, but basically you want to take the outer checksum and use it to validate the inner checksum. And so on hardware that supports just UDP checksums, if this is populated with a checksum value, then we can make use of GRO, and that gives us much better throughput. From what I've seen, I can get somewhere about six um, gigabits without uh, GRO or receive without any kind of RX checksum off tunnel recognizing RX checksum offload. But if I have this outer UDP checksum present, then I can move it about 12 gigabits, 11 to 12 gigabits, depending on the hardware and the setup. So what I wanted to do um, is take all this hardware that's out there that's starting to recognize how to perform TSO for a tunnel datagram and make it so that it could do TSO for a tunnel datagram with the outer UDP checksum. 
Because then you could have a homogeneous environment and uh, improve the overall performance. So I started looking into this. And I found a couple things that kind of started to happen. Specifically, when you segment a frame like this, like just doing it in software, the, the checksum for all of these packets, except for the last, was exactly the same value. Every one of these UDP checksums had the exact same value except for the last one. And what it turned out to be is essentially all of the data up here was canceling itself out. So IPv4 uh, has a length field in it, and a, or the length field will vary between these last two, but the other piece that for IPv4 that varies is the ID field. But I didn't need to worry about it. The checksum for IPv4 will cancel out that ID field, so that value ends up being a wash in the uh, final result. Same thing for TCP. Um, all I had to worry about was the pseudo header checksum, and those values don't change as long as the length is fixed. So what I could do is I only needed to compute this value once and somehow stuff it into all of these spots. And this last piece I had to do something else with. So the idea I came up with is, well, I'll just go ahead and chop this off into an even multiple of MSS, populate a value here, and kind of cross my fingers and see what happens, start testing hardware to see what they're doing with this value. So my hope was maybe it's dumb hardware and it'll just stuff in whatever I gave it assuming that I was going to give it zero, but instead it just carries it through. And that's pretty much what it ended up uh, doing. So like, I was actually starting out with uh, I40E as my test, um, but I moved on to some other parts. I actually had a couple of Mellanox NICs I could test with as well. Um, but basically what I ended up finding is whatever value you stepped in here, in almost all cases it would just get replicated. So what I could do is Calculate this, everything before the TCP header, essentially, as though I was actually sending a single frame. And then the rest of this could all be segmented by the hardware and it would have no impact on any of the checksums or any of the data up front here. And so I could hand that to the hardware and it would segment it like it was a normal frame. The other thing I found is that it looks like the TSO code, by default, if you're especially under stress, it just gives you even multiple MSS segments anyway. More often than not, I didn't see this little trailer. It just always ended up being MSS chunks as long as you're, you know, saturating the wire. And so that made it so essentially I had, you know, this whole section could be replicated, especially in the case of IPv6, I could just basically replicate everything from here to the end. In the case of IPv4, I had the ID fields I had to worry about, but other than that, this whole block was essentially getting replicated by the hardware. But so that got me thinking. So that whole block, like I mentioned here, this whole thing could, is essentially replicated. I had it written down, and the hardware was just duplicating it for the most part. The only difference being the IPv4 ID fields would vary. And so I started thinking to myself, is there some way I could make it so I could do tunnel offloads on hardware that doesn't actually support tunnel offloads? So I started looking into it. In case of IPv6, I can just support it. Done. Instant win. If I can just come up with a way of Getting that whole header to be replicated, that works great for me. The only problem is the IPv4 ID field. So I started looking into it more. Um, for the most part, TCP flows always set the DF bit. So that being the case, we don't have to worry about the headers being fragmented. So then why do we care about the ID field? Did some more digging, and it turns out there's even an RFC that states you're not supposed to be looking at the ID field unless you can actually fragment the packet. And so I started looking at it, and it's like, okay, well in that case, maybe I'll just go ahead and hack on a driver, in this case being IXGBE. Um, I added a feature, actually I actually added a different feature initially, but what I ended up coming up with was this feature flag, NetFF TSO Mangle ID. It basically means for a TSO, as long as the DF bit's set, let the hardware do whatever it wants with the, the IP ID value. I don't care. If you want to replicate the one you've got, go for it. If you want to increment, go for it. Just go ahead and do it. Um, the one gotcha on that, though, is I did get quite a bit of pushback because essentially, in the case of GRO with GSO, we can potentially end up losing data because the IP, IPv4 IDs aren't going to be the same necessarily as they were coming in. So we leave it right now and disabled by default. But pretty much any hardware that can support TSO right now is getting the hardware flag, hardware feature flag for this uh, set. So it could turn it on. 
Um, the basic idea being there were some other cases that came up that could actually benefit from this. But so net result, I ended up working first with IXGBE, but the, most of the Intel drivers had a similar mechanism. What I was actually doing is I was cheating. They had this concept of an IP and IP tunnel support, which really wasn't really IP and IP tunnel support. This supported a flexible uh, L3 header size. So I can specify any length up to 511 bytes as my L3 header. So I went ahead and just started saying, okay, you're gonna skip everything except for the outer header. Um, main reason I had to keep the outer header is because I had to be able to increment the IP ID in the outer header because the UDP tunnels do not support, uh, well, you can't basically set the DF bit because they don't support path MTU discovery and whatnot. So you, they are always gonna be fragmentable. So I do have to keep this field intact, but everything after it, I can basically skip as though it's one giant IP option. Um, let's see, and then, yeah. And so as long as none of these fields have to be modified, I can go ahead and support TSO on the hardware. Uh, the one gotcha, like I said, I was treating this as like one giant IP option. As it turned out, uh, the IPv4 header was trying to compute the checksum over this entire region. So I had to take the uh, checksum for this, I had to actually take the checksum for this entire region and stuff it in here instead of zero to seed the checksum itself. Once I did that, then it went through checksum that whole thing and can that canceled that out and it only did that bit. So it's a bit of a dirty hack, but it actually makes it all work. So, uh, got that out there, pushed a couple patches and I actually started to get some feedback. Uh, one of the things that actually came up is everybody was, that was doing, uh, apparently people doing IPv6 to IPv4 translation were suddenly jumping for joy with this because they got GRO support. Um, one of the things that as, was a result of this, I had to be able to support a fixed ID on the GRO side. So in the process, I basically added a new GSO type called fixed ID, which basically means I saw this packet coming in and the IP ID was not changing, so it's this value for all packets. She gives you GRO, but on the segment side, it's bad unless you have the Mango ID on, so. But in the grand scheme of things, basically, it gives us a way to deal with uh, things that are already mangling the IPv4 ID field. Let's see. Yeah, so, uh, go back to this real quick. So yeah, basically, net result with all of this stuff is I saw a fairly significant performance gain. Um, I didn't want to actually say the numbers for it because it's kind of hard for me to actually catalog it exactly because like the NIC I was testing on, like in the case of IXGBE, um, I was actually testing from the PF to a VF, and the problem is I didn't have enough PCIe bandwidth to actually measure the link in between because I hit the PCIe rate limit, so I was bottlenecked, so I couldn't tell the actual gain. Um, I basically had gone from six to 15 gigabits for throughput, and it's like, okay, well, I can't go any faster because that's the same level I was getting if I did just TSO across it without the tunnel. So I was uh, basically capped at PCIe at that point, but I'm looking at like at least a two to three X gain uh, for the total throughput on all that. But yeah, some basic lessons learned. Um, everyone should really look at translating the drivers to support NetFF hardware CSUM. Uh, anything where you're having to parse protocols is just going to be painful going forward. There's too many things getting added too quickly to the protocol stacks for us to keep up with all of it. Basically every time there's a new tunnel added, it's like, okay, you gotta offload this now as well. Do we really wanna go through and rewrite all the drivers to add that to all of their little parsers so that they can all recognize that either they do or they don't support it? Uh, I prefer to not have to do that. Um, the other piece, check some unnecessary. That, this is basically what all of this is working around, is the fact that we don't have support for this. Um, if we had uh, checksum uh, complete, or drivers that supported that, basically reporting the checksum for the entire packet up to but not including the ethernet header, then what we'd be able to do is just use that and work backwards. But the problem is we don't have that so we need to have an outer UDP checksum present, which means we have to have the two checksums per packet, which is why we had all of this extra complication. If we didn't have that, then the receive side would just be able to say, okay, here, I've got the checksum, I'll work it backwards. And the last bit is parsing based, yeah, parsing is just unreliable. One of the things I was kicking myself for is I actually had to go back and I was trying to work on 
know, there ends up being a lot of drivers I was working on where I'd start testing, it's like, okay, the easiest test for me to see whether or not this is working, I'm gonna spawn 20 v, v, uh, VXLAN ports on this device. And after I did about, you know, like in the case of I-40E, I think it's 16, all of a sudden, pfft, yeah, the performance just craters. So like with that one, it was, I get past the 16 ports, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at, you know, six gigabits for receive because it's not doing the receive checksum offload anymore. Um, but fortunately in the case of the Intel parts, most of them do the TX offloads in a generic enough way that they're just looking at the offsets. They don't care about what the actual tunnel type is. It's just receive side that's that bad. The really ugly one is where we get into the TX path relies on this stuff. Good example of that being the FM10K, which I'm kind of kicking myself for. I fought against it, but basically that supports one port for tunnel offloads. And the problem is that one port worth of tunnel offloads is both TX and RX. So if you go off of that, you have to kill all the TX offloads on the part. Um, to some extent, we're working around that in the driver code at this point because we've got the, was it NDO features check which is basically now becoming this list of, okay, what can't I offload? And we have to go through and strip features off the uh, features flags before we can actually transmit the parts. So we have to verify at this point whether or not, you know, UDP tunnel uh, segmentation really means UDP tunnel segmentation, or does it just mean this one little tiny case over here that, you know, okay, well, we straight off of it, yeah, we turn off all the offloads, can't support anything. It becomes painful to do that. That's why I really think we need to get to the point where things are just generic, simple. You know, checksum complete and NetFF hardware checksum, just those two at minimum gives you so much uh, improvement. It gives you 12 gigs for throughput on at least the Intel parts when I had just, you know, it, just the outer checksum and that uh, and NetFF hardware checksum gave me 12 gigs of throughput versus six. So you're talking about doubling performance with just those two changes. It'd definitely be worth it just to have everybody try to move over to that. So as far as uh, conclusions and such, see, um, honestly what this ends up being is essentially a half measure. It's a translation. I had to make it so that the hardware could somehow understand this, and that's what I ended up doing here. The funny thing is, you know, I took parts, what is it? We're at, I'm trying to think, uh, 82599 is what, nine, 10 years old? I got it running about as fast as an I-40E would with the same kind of tunnel type just because the TX descriptors were flexible enough that I could do a few little dirty hacks and yeah, okay, there, I got support for this tunnel type for segmentation offload. And so doing that, I was able to just double the RX throughput, you know, get the TX to the point where I couldn't even really max out the TX because I hit PCIe limits before I even got that far. You know, it ends up being something where the, the less complicated we can make this hardware going forward, the easier this would make it for us as software engineers. You know, just basic things. Like, you know, with GSO Partial at this point, I was sitting there looking at it as thinking I could almost get away with supporting just about anything going forward. You know, I could almost make hardware that would have uh, TSO support, and all I need is an offset and a checksum offset, and that's it, you know because I didn't have to change any of those outer headers anymore. So the, the simpler we can keep this, the better. Um, and the fact is, there's, this, this is already starting to kick off other things. So what we ended up doing, I uh, worked with uh, Stephen Classert on getting uh, us support for supporting frag lists indirectly on devices that don't support frag lists. Because what we could do is just, okay, instead of doing the full GSO and having to split everything apart, well, I'll just break it into just frags SKBs instead of ones that have frag list on it. You know, you end up saving yourself a lot of trouble when you don't have to uh, break a uh, packet up into 40 SK buffs. You only have to do three because, you know, you got your chain of uh, three SKBs with 16, descript or 16 uh, pages each. Um, and the last bit on this, I'm still kind of debating it myself, but I'm wondering if I should enable TSO Mingle ID by default. The fact is, it's an IPv4 ID for packets that have the DF bit set. Spec says you're not supposed to look. Uh, I'm not sure how many cases it would actually hurt to just turn this on by default. The fact is, we may actually see a performance gain for a number of other cases. You know, if you're doing IPv6 to IPv4 translation, it converts the ID field to zero. 
do we really want to make somebody have to pay an extra penalty to, in order to route that off somewhere else, or we just let them mangle the IPv4 ID? It's just kind of a thought and all that. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it's, you know, it's one of those ones where you, there's going to be a corner case somewhere that comes back to bite us, and that's what I'm kind of worried about with that. So that's why I'm not 100% certain I should do it or not. But anyway, with that, I think that's uh, all I have. So, yeah, questions? So, um, you know, I, de I definitely think this reflects a lot of great work over the years. And if you think about where we started and where we are, um, you know, Edwards L LCO, I think that was almost like a scientific discovery. So, uh, GSO partial. Um, so, a lot of great work here. So, the way I like to think about this is there's five basic offloads that we need out of a NIC RSS, receive checksum, transmit checksum, uh, TSO, and LRO. So this first four, actually, I think we're pretty close to saying they're, they're solved problems, which is really cool. Right. So you didn't mention the RSS, but I think we're just assuming that when we're doing UDP encapsulation, we use a source port to get the right. entropy, and that's kind of solved. And then the received checksum offload, transmit checksum offload, um, those are solved by the thing we mentioned. Right. TSO partial solves uh, using TSO. So the one outstanding one we have now is our old friend LRO. Um, LRO implies that we have to parse the packet in right. the hardware, and then we get into your problem of hardware-specific parsers. Yeah. So I think we might be at the point where we should start to figure out, can we actually do generic LRO? Um, what are you talking about, like, be a XDP, right? Well, not even XDP. Well, so that would be a generic GRO, and I think we, I yeah. think we have a need for both. Um, but in the case of a generic LRO, could we load the BPF program or something equivalent to do the LRO logic? And one problem we've historically had with LRO is it's complete black box. Right. Uh, we have no idea what, what the device is doing. They may not implement timers we want or something like that. So a lot of us have already turned off LRO for that reason. If it was programmable, we may actually be able to bring that back into the fold. So this might be the next uh, frontier of the offloads to figure out the LRO problem. Yeah, I don't know. See, that's the thing is that's, that's the, the, I think to some extent that might end up being the Trojan horse for vendors to say, yeah, no, forget it. We have to have the parsers. That would be my one concern with all that. Well, so if you remember on the list, we had this other problem. Uh, if somebody wants to do checksum unnecessary on an inner header, right. they have to parse. Yep. They have to parse the encapsulation. Right. Then we had this problem: is they're based, just basing this on UDP port number, yep. which is technically incorrect. Right. And it's okay if they're just kind of doing checksum offload, but if somebody was trying to do LRO. And that wasn't what we thought it was because UDP port numbers don't have firm meaning in the network. Right. That can actually end, end up mangling packets. So in one sense, people are going to do this anyway, so maybe we need to, to figure out what is the correct way to do this. We need something down on the device that's very specific that says this type of packet is actually what the host thinks it is. You're allowed to, allowed to deal with it. So we might need this in the long run anyway. I, I think Eventually, they're going to have this, and um, using LRO as kind of the case study over the next, like I said, maybe the next frontier might be worth looking at. Yeah. To some extent, that's probably true, because I know, was it, I think the upper limit right now for GRO is, I'm seeing, well, depends on the setup, but I think I was running about 15 gigs um, for a single, or no, maybe it was 12 for a single CPU if I turned off all the, like, turbo mode and all of that stuff. So uh, that was also on a fairly low clock. So, But yeah, because that's the one thing is we start getting into these 100 gig parts, there's going to be probably going to be a resurgence of LRO, I'd imagine. So to some extent, yeah, we're probably going to need it. But uh, we really need to go through and strongly define at this point exactly what fields need to match in order for it to all come together on that. So on, on Mennonox, uh, 40 gig, uh, we reach uh, 34 gig with one core. With tunnels? No. Oh. Just GRO. Yeah, just GRO without tunnels? Yeah. But when you add the tunnel with tunnels. Without it's, it's, it's not a big deal. The GRO unit is able to, to do that at uh, a good speed. Hmm. Yeah, because, well, I'll have to take a look at the code again, but yeah. 
So the one I was testing on, I was maxing out at about 12, so. But as, like I said, I turned off all the turbo mode and all that, so it was base clock, and then on top of it, it's like a, the, my system's one of those ones where it's got like 88 cores, so the clocks aren't running all that fast in the first place, so. Or 88 threads, yeah, anyway. So any other questions? Have you looked at the, excuse me, the, the pass-throughs from like virtual machines so that those are all handled properly so inside the VM they can have the right settings so that when the packets get encapsulated or just bridged, they end up being just checksummed in the hardware without having issues? Um, so you're talking about like uh, going from a tap interface down and all of that. So, well, the GSO partial doesn't actually run on the tap interface itself. It's normally just passing that as a TSO. Um, so what happens is all this basically, get, I'm trying to remember, does, shoot, does tap, I don't remember off the top of my head if tap supports, or the vhost supports passing tunneled frames or not. So I don't think it does. As far as I know, I think it only does TSO. So that will come down, usually it gets into like open vSwitch or a bridge, gets encapsulated into VXLAN at that point. So basically all the stuff I was calling out here normally happens just before we hand it off to hardware. And so the GSO partial will kick in, in the GSO layer at the NIC itself. So in, up in the software devices, we shouldn't need to actually do this. It's just when we get down to the actual transition to hardware that then we have to go ahead and segment it before we actually put it on the wire. So as far as I know, I don't think any, well, yeah, none of the VirtIO or any of that are supporting uh, GSO partial, because right now it's only hardware devices that I'm enabling that functionality on, so. Yeah, I think, how much time? Thank you. Uh, question about who's doing all this uh, IPv6 to v4 translation? I wasn't aware, forgive my ignorance, but I wasn't aware if there was NAS64 code that admitted into the kernel or not. I think it's like uh, cell phone providers and such are doing it, I believe. I'm trying to remember now, because that's the thing. This is an email thread from like six to nine months ago, so I can't remember off the top of my head. If you go searching, though, somewhere in the thread, somebody brought up the whole IPv6 to IPv4 translation, having the IPID field zero, that, and there's RFCs that call out how to translate between the two. They specify to set the value to zero.